So if you think that galaxies are receding, the data would imply that some galaxies are moving away faster than the speed of light, which is nonsensical because the speed of light is a maximum. Hello, everyone. So today I'm here with Sahil Gupta. Um, he created the big circles model, and we're going to go over it. A little bit of background about Sahil. He's an entrepreneur. He started a company called Space. Before that, he worked at Tesla, and he has been thinking about cosmology for a long time. And there are many problems with the Big Bang Theory, and we're going to discuss Dan and discuss his theory. Hi, Sahil, how are you doing? Hey, Giuliano, it's good to see you again. And I'm uh, really yeah. excited for round two. Sounds good. So let's go over the Big Bang Theory and why there are many problems with the Big Bang Theory. Can you list some of them? Yeah. Uh, the, the reason the Big Bang Theory was proposed was that Cosmologists observed a redshift of light from other galaxies. So they knew the kind of stars that were emitting light in galaxies far away. But the spectrum that we received from our telescopes, looking at those really, really far away galaxies, uh, showed that the light was redshifted. So the conclusion at the time, which is about 100 years ago, was that the reason that there's a redshift was that galaxies are supposedly moving away from the Milky Way. And if something's moving away, that might explain the redshift. So that got baked into the body of knowledge. And then cosmologists at the time extrapolated that if galaxies are receding, then if you imagine reversing time, then everything was coming closer together. And you apparently have a Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. So that's the reason that the Big Bang was proposed, because of the redshift. And the, you know, that, that concept of galactic precession was then <clears throat> changed into space expanding because it was kind of embarrassing to have a situation where some galaxies were moving away faster than the speed of light, which is <laughs> what one would have to believe to continue with the galactic recession idea. So if you think that galaxies are receding, the data would imply that some galaxies are moving away faster than the speed of light, which is nonsensical because the speed of light is a maximum. So that was updated into, uh, it was obscured into the concept of space expanding, which doesn't make many, which doesn't make sense. Uh, especially with the fact that it requires space to have expanded faster than the speed of light. You know, this is this is a kludge at the biggest scale. Uh, so the top problems with the Big Bang theory, and I think we should start calling it the Big Bang model because it is, it's a model. It's an idea that uh, people pro propose and test and iterate on. Uh, and so the problems are that there are, there's a concept of faster than light, which is a problem. And it cannot be glossed over. Uh, there's a unfortunate strain on the internet and in academia, where it's now considered an act of wisdom to believe in nonsense, which is not a good thing. Um, so this faster than light thing is a real problem. Uh, and another problem, which is essentially, you know, it's the ace in the hole, it's incontrovertible. Uh, and it is the existence of morphologically old galaxies really far away. So there's really old stuff in terms of shape in terms of the shape of the galaxy, like you can tell from the shape that it's old. So really old stuff, really far away. And I'll mention a few names of these galaxies uh, so people can independently look them up. Uh, like XMM2599, I'll just say one, XMM2599. Uh, if people Google XMM2599, uh, it's very clear that there's something very old, very far away. And the reason that contradicts the Big Bang's model uh, the Big Bang model is that it claims that the distant universe should only contain very early, uh, you know, very, uh, very early type objects, which is evidently not the case. Um, and now, you know, question might be, you know, why is it, uh, why is this only being called out now? 
And I mean, then I can just say a few words on that because it's people will write books about it, but it's essentially, um, it's, 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 it's modern day groupthink uh, and it's groupthink, you know, at modern magnitudes. So it's going to be that hard to overcome. Um, and the simplest analogy here is to the, to the development you know, of, of the, for the, the transformation of the geocentric model into the heliocentric model 500, 500 years ago, um, where uh, it's almost an exact replay of the same social dynamics. Um, like it's, you know, I try to imagine being in the shoes of somebody 500 years ago and trying to speak to some of these, you know, uh, highly credentialed natural philosophers at these universities all across, uh, you know, uh, all across and receiving rejection because you're not using the right mathematics, uh, rejection because you don't believe the same epicycles that they do. Um, and it's, and, and what I learned from history is that it is possible, you know, f f for this kind of a shift in thinking to happen and that uh, I'm not alone. There are a lot of, uh, there are so many uh, astrophysicists and cosmologists calling out problems with the standard model uh, and that something like this is bound to happen. So that's my, you know, that's my initial opening. <laughs> that's a lot of information, uh, but the point is that there are mature galaxies far away. Sounds good, and uh, I I think that for the viewers, just uh, to explain a little bit further, um, farther away objects are really like when you go far away, you're basically looking to the past, right? Because it takes time for light to to arrive at our eyes, right? So having mature galaxies far away is a problem because they should be really young because we're basically looking at the, like, like at the past basically, right? Is that correct? Or am I missing something there? Yeah, for example, if you look at the sun, you're looking eight minutes, uh, the, the light, you know, took eight minutes to get to you. Our telescopes are to our, to our eyes. So likewise with stuff even farther away. Uh, so question, could it be that uh, there are measurement problems somehow? So could it be that maybe you were measuring these galaxies uh, that are really far away in some weird way and, you know, the Big Bang Theory is correct and or the model is correct and, you know, maybe the measurements that we're doing, uh, they are somehow wrong? I think measurements can always be improved, uh, but in this case, uh, it's like comparative distance. So it's like, you know, this thing is farther away than that thing. Right. So you can just do that mm -hmm. consecutive, you know, oh, this is farther than that, farther than that, farther than that. And then the farthest thing that we see is old. <laughs> so that's like, that's uh, it's, it's pretty clear that it's an old thing that's far away. And I'm not saying that everything that's far away is old. Uh, I'm saying there's a distribution. So there's young stuff and old stuff far away, uh, which I think should lead one to conclude that it's, um, it's like a snapshot in in eternity. Like there can be, there's a distribution of old and young stuff at all distances. So this is where I'd say there's there's going to be a shift in thinking into the universe being in dynamical equilibrium, where it's eternally it it's eternal, which means that time goes infinitely back and infinitely forward. And we're at the center. It's like we right now are at the center of infinite of infinity uh, of time going in both directions. And so it makes sense that when you look at the distant universe, you see a distribution of young and old things. Cool. Um, so these are two problems that we talk talked about or three pro problems. I think there are a few others, right? It seems that there are galaxies as well that we measure their age and their age is older okay. than the Big Bang Theory measures the age of the universe. It seems that we're finding galaxies that are older than, you know, uh, the age of the universe by the Big Bang model. Yeah. Is that correct? Like, there's another problem uh, yeah. that that's pointed out by that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are uh, there are galaxies that are farther away uh, just by using 
uh, you know, just looking at the NASA extragalactic database of, mm -hmm. of all, you know, objects that we have redshift information on, there are galaxies that are farther than 13, 14 billion light years away. Uh, you know, there's some even like 80 billion light years away, if you just look at the data set. Uh, but, you know, what, what ends up happening is that uh, people in Big Bang cosmology squash that into their own metric. You know, their metric is their model. And, and they like squash that down to under 13.8 billion light years. Uh, so it's another case of the model constraining, the, the model distorting the raw observational data. And the other important thing is that not only the fact that there's old, there's morphologically old stuff far away, but the fact that the materials in those stars needed also time to form. So the raw materials in the stars are older than 13.8 billion years. So the reason to emphasize this is to make it, you know, uh, only obvious that there are things that are older than the supposed Big Bang. So in the context of that knowledge, it's time to start thinking that it's, it requires a certain mental fortitude to like read the internet and go through all this information. But the, the important thing to, you know, the important, uh, idea to always keep in mind when processing information is what framework is it written in? You know, what language or thought process resulted in that information being written? So, and, and always test it against the concept that is this author aware that there are mature galaxies far away or are they talking in their own limited worldview? Um, so this is something that people can develop independently. You know, you just, it's, you know, just thinking for yourself, I think it's really important. And, um, and before moving on to more complex ideas, I think anybody can really deep down understand that if there's, if they're morphologically old galaxies far away, that contradicts the idea that the distant universe is the young universe. So it cannot, cannot be true. So why are you saying that Hubble was incorrect? Oh, did I, did I say that or? No, I'm, I'm asking. Oh, yeah. uh, Hubble, no, he just made the measurements. He made measurements of, uh, uh, of redshift. Um, he actually, interestingly, was uh, skeptical of the expanding, in his words, exploding universe, which is might be a surprise because it's uh, in popular science, it's commonly and often repeated that Hubble supposedly proved the universe was expanding. Uh, and it's something that I thought before I got into this, you know, uh, 20 weeks ago. Uh, but looking at primary sources, Hubble's own writing, uh, even newspaper clippings where Hubble is quoted, he explicitly rejects the model of the expanding universe. So this to say that we can we can disentangle redshift from expanding, you know, claims of expansion. So the redshift is its own phenomenon, which deserves examination and scrutiny, uh, and that it should be separated from this concept of expansion. Cool. Yeah, we will link uh, to at least one article or we'll show an article of Hubble uh, when he basically measure, you know, the redshift data and he wasn't sure if it was the expanding universe or if it was another phenomenon, right? Uh, I'll, I'll share that with the viewers. Um, cool. So it seems, it seems like there are a few problems or many problems with the Big Bang model. Um, and given that you, you were exploring um, the, basically the Hubble constant or the H constant and you got into uh, a new kind of theory, right? Uh, which you call the big circles model. Um, can you, go over how you arrived at that and <laughs> yeah. what it means. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be telling the story forever. <laughs> the, uh, it started with, um, maybe I'll start at the very beginning. So, uh, I, uh, there was a moment a couple of months ago where I realized there were too many rectangles in my life. And I mean, rectangles, <laughs> you know, I rectangular pages, rectangular screens, too many screens, you know, it, it's like your life is going into the computer, which, you know, it should not be going into the computer. Uh, but uh, there are too many rectangles. Like, you know, my apartment was a rectangle. 
Uh, you know, there's just like too many, this just too, it's just too much. Uh, and so I started thinking about circles and spheres and that, you know, I wanted more circles in my life. Uh, and so I started in a very abstract, but also a very real sense. Uh, so I started thinking about, um, the, you know, the value of, uh, pi or tau to pi. Uh, I started looking at the etymology of words, uh, and I found it interesting. If you look at the etymology of many, many words, it's amazing how often they come down to, they boil down to two concepts of things going in straight lines and things turning. And so the, these geometrical concepts are baked into our language. You know, it's, that's how, that's what amazes me. Uh, so just a few words that, you know, boil down to concepts of straight lines and turning. Uh, I can mention, uh, you know, law and verse, uh, or, uh, you know, direction, directions or, uh, uh, conversation, like those two words boil down to things going straight and things turning. And, um, uh, and even the word universe, you know, the word universe is one verse, one turn, uh, which I think, uh, you know, however, that word got baked into our language, uh, how interesting is it that that can be related to a circle? Um, so those, even the word tortoise, you know, I thought that was really funny. The word tortoise, uh, boils down to something that's turning. You know, back to the, you know, the, the supposed idea that <laughs> it's turtles all the way down. Uh, actually, the word turtle also, turtle and tortoise. Uh, so that was really funny for me. Uh, that was really funny to me. Um, that, you know, language comes from geometry. Uh, and, and if you think about it, if you think about the earliest life forms, like amoebas, you know, and them interacting with each other, what kind of, what kind of thoughts are they exchanging? Uh, and I thought it would be, you know, stuff like, oh, go this way or turn that way. So it's, it's like directions of motion. So that's why language is so connected to straight lines and curves. Uh, and, um, so then I started looking into pi and, and, uh, and why it is what it is. Uh, and it's really interesting, uh, expansion that. It's, it's, it really is an infinite series, uh, like the most elegant, the most elegant form of it is an infinite series of, uh, repeated sums and sums and differences of the square root of two, which is really amazing. So it's not like some, it's not like some thing plucked out of nowhere. It has a very, it has a strong basis in, in just multiplication and division and integers. So that's why I think it's, uh, quite interesting. Uh, so then I started looking at the started looking at, uh, and simultaneously, I was looking at uh, what Stephen Wolfram was doing with his, uh, what's the best way to put this, a, his hypergraph model of the universe, uh, where he's trying to boil down the most elemental rules and, and let them run and, and see if he can map them onto knowledge that we already have. Uh, so I was thinking about what Wolfram was doing, which is really amazing, by the way. And, um, and, uh, and I think it's important for people. So it's important for people to uh, examine their assumptions as fundamentally as is done in Wolfram's model. So I think it's really great. Um, I was also looking at the. Um, I was also looking at Penrose's work on um, these anomalies in the cosmic microwave map. So Penrose was looking at. You know the, the the cosmic microwave uh, map, and he found these disks and rings that were slightly warmer than two point seven Kelvin. So, long story short, he uh, speculated and has strong reason to you know think that it's true that uh, they are the remnants of evaporated black holes because there's. There is no other way to explain uh, the slightly warmer disks that are, you know, slightly warmer than two point seven Kelvin in the night sky, um, and he concluded from that that there the 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 universe may be older than thirteen point eight billion years, because black holes cannot, you know, form and live and evaporate within thirteen point eight billion years, much longer than that. So that showed me that maybe I can start thinking as if there are things that are older than 13.8 billion years. 
Um, and so that was a big takeaway from Penrose's work. Um, and, and his model is actually, um, he models it as a cyclically, like multiple Big Bangs. That's how he models it. Uh, but uh, I think he may change his mind when he realizes he can let go of the expansion concept. Uh, so you don't have to have this. Uh, so you don't have to say that the, the black holes are from a previous eon. You can say that they are in the universe and and they are there. They're just really old. Um, so uh, integrating, you know, everything I was thinking about when it came to uh, when it came to uh, circles, uh, when it came to Wolfram's work, when it came to Penrose's work, um, and I was also, I should, you know, I should mention it because I think uh, it's. I mean, it's true. So I was also reading the blog of uh, Kirsten Hacker, who is a, a particle physicist who uh, does just a really amazing job of explaining uh, extraordinarily complex ideas and extraordinarily simple language. And uh, she had a very she had a very interesting blog post relate uh, comparing Wolfram, Penrose, and Dirac. This is not a joke. <laughs> there, there literally is a blog post uh, talking about Wolfram and Penrose and Dirac, uh, and uh, and in it, she, uh, I think there was an interesting, uh, there was something unusual that I found, which uh, related Planck's constant to the mass of the proton and the uh, speed of light. And, but there was something in it that was incomplete. Like the multiple, it wasn't quite right. So it might've been a typo, uh, but then I just chased that down. And I realized that Planck's constant equals the mass of the proton times the radius of a proton charge times the speed of light times pi over two, precisely. And that was very, very interesting to me that this supposedly impenetrable constant uh, could be written in terms of things that are more, that are like experimental measurements and that are equally interesting, like the proton mass, proton radius, speed of light, pi over two. And there's always a guard up you know, that you, it's, you know, fudging numbers together is not science. At the same time, I think you have to be open minded enough to recognize simplicity and elegance and beauty and symmetry. So, uh, and, and you're acting on a belief and knowledge that the universe is uh, describable in terms of shapes and numbers. So it's um, when, when you see something that, you know, Planck's constant almost equals the proton mass times proton charge radius times C times pi over two, I think spark should be flying in anybody's. Uh, you know, in anybody's mind. Uh, so uh, I had that thought in mind as well. So as you, you know, I'm telling you a story and like I'm, I have like a thousand things going on at once, but uh, it'll come together. <laughs> so the, uh, so that was also true. Um, or, or it was a, uh, it was a likely true, you know, idea that Planck's constant could be broken down into these things. Um, so then I was chasing, you know, this idea of what, you know, directs, um, uh, you know, you know, basically all his life's work. Uh, and then I came across his large numbers hypothesis that um, if you take the ratio of two, there are these two ratios in all of physics that if you, you know, that they approximately equal 10 to the 40th. So that was the big, that was the big, um, you know, stepping stone that there was a thing that existed that people were speculating that these two ratios equal 10 to the 40th. So it's like, whoa, there's something funky going on here. Um, and, uh, and so I decided to uh, investigate it and I plugged in the speculated expression for Planck's uh, constant, uh, rearranged into the proton radius, and then plugged it into this you know, version of Dirac's large Chambers hypothesis. And then I, I got an equation of all the fundamental constants and uh, and uh, that was like a eureka kind of moment. Uh, and I uh, and then I started thinking about you know what are the properties of this thing? Is it just a fluke? Is it you know just something meaningless or is it meaningful? And I tried to think about it from another way, which is you know what if somebody told you uh, what if somebody told you that there is an equation that has all the fundamental constants in it and a few, you know, pies and a few E's or you know, maybe not actually no E's uh, and, uh, and, you know, maybe an integer like two or four. 
uh, or maybe three, and um, and that the equation is symmetrical and extreme, and uh, each of the quantities is actually conceptually fundamental as this one is, uh, you know, wouldn't you be blown away? So that's the, you know, that's, you know, that's the idea that occurred to me, you know, this equation of all the fundamental constants is not like something squashed together. Uh, and it's, it's a kind of reasoning that doesn't get talked about much, but I think it's okay to start talking about it because, um, you know, we're entering a new kind of world. Um, so I came across a equation with all the fundamental constants that's symmetrical, precise, extreme, and all encompassing that not one fundamental constant is left out. That's another very important feature that there isn't a, there isn't a constant that's left out of it. Um, and, you know, somebody might bring up, oh, what about um, Boltzmann's constant or what about Avogadro's constant? And if one actually investigates those constants, uh, they are derivative. Uh, you know, Avogadro's constant, for example, is just an artifact of relating a proton, uh, proton mass to a gram, which is, uh, based on water, which is not, there are different levels. Uh, so Avogadro's is not fundamental. And then Boltzmann's constant is just relating to the definition of temperature, which is a derivative idea. Uh, so th now going back to, all right, so there's this one equation with all the fundamental constants and there's not one that's left out. You know, that's I think an important quality uh, and the quantities are symmetrical and extreme. So the, um, the next thought that I had was, you know, wow, this, uh, you know, big H is in there, one over 13.8 billion years. And then I thought I, I'd always been told that, you know, I'd, always, I'd always read, you know, you listen to everything you can from all the scientists out there. Uh, and, you know, you chase down uh, primary sources and it's always said, you know, 13.8 billion years is an age. And then I thought, uh, uh, don't ages go up? So maybe if they go up, then this co this coincidence is a temporary kind of thing. So it might not be like that. Maybe now is some extraordinarily special time. Um, but then I thought, uh, what if you know why this equation is so beautiful? Uh, can, can I just run with the idea that maybe it's a constant uh, and ex examine why people think it's an age? So uh, I did that, and I also I did a couple of other counterfactuals, like you know, what if gravity changing? What if big G in the equation is changing? Uh, and then I thought that probably can't be true because we know that Earth formed about four billion years ago, and I think it's fair enough to say that the Earth formed by uh, under you know just rocks coming together under normal gravitational conditions. So it would it just it it's there's no basis to make any claim that gravity is changing uh, and, or, you know, Planck's constant is changing or, and, and the reason it's not, it doesn't make sense to claim that any other, uh, any of the other constants are changing is that if you look at stars extraordinarily far away and you look at their spectrums, uh, spectra, that it's, it's like the same element doing its same thing, just really far away. So even if you have this notion that stuff that's far away is some, it is, is in some kind of different age, uh, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to say that those constants are changing because you're getting light from those systems in a way that's just like any other light. Uh, so that's why I think it's reasonable to say that the constants are constants. They're all constants. Um, so then I started and I went down the path, you know, is what exactly is this H, you know, what is big H? Uh, you know, what is one over 13.8 billion years? Where does it come from? Why do people think it's an age? Uh, and can it be a constant? So that's, uh, that's, that was a big, um, uh, it, it was like a, uh, that was like a big, uh, what, what, what's the analogy here? It's like, uh, it's like a base camp, you know, it's like a, a, a point where <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm onto something. Uh, let me start taking this very seriously. Um, so, uh, uh, so maybe we can talk about the fundamental constant or anything else that you're curious about. If the redshift is not explained by the universe expanding what explains the redshift then yeah uh, the 
redshift data before giving an explanation the redshift data fits a model of continuous decay over a distance so if you take the energy of the photon when measured divided by the energy of when it was emitted it follows a curve that's e you know 2.718 the uh, to e to the minus ht so that is something that can be there can be objective consensus about that that the redshift data does follow e to the minus ht um, and it's a it's something that you know, it appears throughout physics uh, in, for example, the law of cooling, like if you have a cup of coffee in a room uh, that's cooler than the cup of coffee, uh, it cools and the temperature of that cup of coffee goes as e to the minus x, uh, where uh, x is, uh, there's a constant, there's time, uh, and then it's the actual temperature thing minus the surroundings and that those ratios. So, um, and and the, the, the special thing about continuous cooling is that it's, um, it's, it's change that's proportional to its energy at the moment. And um, and it makes sense when you look at when you think of photons as like the most um, the most you know natural idealized things that there are. Uh, so when their energy decay follows e to the minus HD, it's it's like really elegant. <laughs> it's like really beautiful. Uh, and the um, uh, and and I think a term a good term for this is photon hubbling. Uh, and I was inspired from the, the origin of this idea is Fritz Zwicky's work on models of the redshift. He called it lichter muton, which is light fatigue or photon fatigue. Uh, that concept was later pejorated as tired light by a Big Bang cosmologist. And you know if just like talking to people who are like, you know, going to look this up. Uh, tired light is probably the term that will be showing up everywhere. Um, the difficult thing is that every resource that you look, almost every resource that you look at it uh, has a straw man version of it. Uh, they'll have concepts, they'll say something, oh, it, you know, this, the galaxies are not blurry. You know, they're, uh, therefore, tired light is false. You know, that's what they'll say. Uh, but if you actually look at the, uh, the, the primary sources, there's no, nobody saying that it's the, the redshift is by scattering. Nobody's saying that. So that's a complete straw man. Um, there's another argument, which is that uh, um, the, um, so there's that, there's also uh, supernovae light curves. Uh, so that could be, you know, talked about, but the short answer there is that uh, the, the light curves are calibrated, assuming that the expansion model is true. So, it's, I mean, you've seen this in machine learning time and time and time again, where they calibrate the data and then do work on that. And then it's like, no surprise, you get, uh, you get a false output. Um, so that supernovae light curves argument is false. And uh, maybe I can link to some papers on that uh, as well. Um, and there was a third reason that, um, you know, tired light is straw man. Um, uh, it'll come back to me, but I wrote about it in the medium post. Um, uh, and that the, the core idea is that the it's it's just a photon continuously losing energy, um, and there are probably going to be many verbal explanations for it. But the thing that everybody can reach consensus on is that it's modeled by e to the minus ht, and I think that's a very big clue. So you're stating that basically the redshift, which is the data that we see. Uh, so for for the viewers out there, uh, when we look out in, in the universe, uh, galaxies that are farther away, they are redder than uh, galaxies that are closer. And I, if I'm not mistake, what Sahil is saying is that the reason for the redness is not because the universe is expanding, which would be uh, explained by the Doppler effect, but it's because photons are basically losing energy or there there's this effect called photon hubbling that actually 
is described by e to the minus um, h. Is that correct? And if that's correct, does the data match your model, or is it does it match the Doppler effect uh, better? Uh, it matches the model of e to the minus h d better, and it doesn't have it doesn't require anything nonsensical like galaxy is moving away faster than the speed of light or space expanding, which is, doesn't make sense. It's, it's become a, it's become a, uh, it's just a massive fiction that's been constructed. That's not self-consistent. Um, so I mean, big, this is, this is the, you know, if you, if you look at cosmology, like a code base, which I think is a very helpful way, way to look at it, the, there's a bug in the code and the bug in the code is attributing the redshift to the Doppler effect. And people have just been, you know, people come out of universities, they, you know, do their PhD programs and have to, you know, follow the advice of their mentors and, you know, uh, professors and, uh, and build off their work. So it's like a code base where, you know, the, these junior software engineers are adding code to the code base, but there's a pretty, there's a glaring bug, you know, that was uh, inserted a hundred years ago. So it's all, it's built on unstable and false foundations. Uh, so it's really important that we direct our attention to the root of the problem and the root of the problem is attributing the redshift for the Doppler effect. Cool. Um, do you, I'm going to share uh, the data and the model that you created and, and all the data is, uh, is open for anyone to see and it's provided by NASA. Um, a follow up question is what kind of experiments or what kind of. What kind of experiments and what kinds of phenomena would we observe besides uh, the redshift if the photon hubbling is correct if your model uh, that photons are shifting uh, by this phenomena called photo hubbling, uh, what other phenomena would, would we see? Uh, uh, is there any other way that we can prove that your model is correct? Maybe not now, but maybe a hundred years from now or, you know, in the future. I think it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's it's a model that will have uh, it will have higher and higher confidence in it just by additional measurements of more galaxies and their redshift because uh, the prediction which I'll just put it in the most formal language I can I mean if, if we measure more galaxies I predict that more of them will uh, will have redshift that's consistent with e to the minus ht that is the prediction uh, yeah cool and. If the Big Bang model is not correct, uh, I guess if we move a few uh, light years from the Earth, we would see galaxies that are not visible right now, right? Is that correct? Or uh, are there other things that we could like maybe falsify the Big Bang model and, and maybe uh, make sure that your model is correct? Uh, are there other experiments or other things that we could check out in the universe. Oh uh, yeah, there are other uh, phenomena that um, are uh, inconsistent with Big Bang LCD and cosmology, uh, including the, the, the fast rotation curves of galaxies. Uh, this was something that Fritz Wicke also noticed. Uh, he called it, uh, he noticed basically that galaxies were, uh, the, the motion of the motion of, of these of galaxies and galaxy clusters was faster than you'd expect, just assuming that gravity could be modeled as G times M over R squared. Uh, and um, he, he gave a name to this, he called it uh, Dunkla Materiae, uh, which is, you know, like dark matter. Uh, but that was a placeholder term. Uh, the um, So going, you know, coming back to the present, the uh, it's, it's, I mean, we have data on hundreds of galaxies and the rotation curves. And by that, I mean, if you look at galaxies, if you know how far away, they, if you know, uh, actually it's not about distance to them, it's just them themselves. If you look at how fast each star in a galaxy is spinning around the center, you get that that's a velocity. Uh, and you also get the radius of that star from the center of the galaxy. Uh, 
Uh, so you have those two pieces of information. And you also have the uh, information of the total mass uh, radially within that galaxy up to that star. So you have the, the mass that is that can be pulling on the star as it's going around the galaxy. Uh, and uh, when you model it, that uh, when you model it, it's uh, clear that modeling the acceleration, like v squared over r, uh, and trying to you know equate that to g times total mass over r squared, uh, doesn't work. Uh, the velocity is bit it's higher, um, so that's you know that's the problem, or that's the that's the it's not a problem. It's just that's the uh, observation which hasn't been explained yet, uh, and um, and what the scientific establishment went with is they thought it was they thought they could explain it with with this thing called dark matter, uh, and so what they do and what they do in the most precise terms is they post facto fit these rotation curves with invisible matter. And then they massage that cloud to get that curve that they want. That's not science. That's post facto curve fitting with nonsense. Uh, and um, it's something that, you know, people will probably have seen in really bad macroeconomics uh, or <laughs> really bad uh, software where there's a, there's something that you you know you don't understand and so it's like they uh they cut co they cover it up with nonsense and the reason that's bad is that it inhib it inhibits better questions being asked so it is a bad thing to be doing what these cold dark matter people are doing uh and uh the alternative uh and and these are the same people who say that oh uh, like the visible matter in the universe is like five percent or something of, the, of all the mass and dark matter is 30 percent and dark energy is 70 percent which is all it's all it's all it's all false um so dark matter is being essentially falsified by modified gravity which i'll talk about just next uh dark energy has been falsified by a paper by subir sarkar and et al where uh dark energy is actually the thing that is called dark energy is actually a bad measurement that neglects the motion of the solar system so there is no dark energy uh so, I mean, and this is stuff that would be happening independent of what I'm saying. I mean, people are finding problems within Big Bang, LCD, and cosmology, the standard model. Uh, and I hope I'm just, you know, accelerating uh, it being replaced because I found this coincidence that gives sufficient reason to think that H is a constant. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the thing about rotation curves. And the thing about the galactic rotation curves is that the alternative modified gravity uh, which is proposed by uh, Modi Milgram, I think it was like 30 or 40 years ago. Um, it doesn't require anything nonsensical. <laughs> I'll be repeating this phrase probably a lot. Yeah. It doesn't require anything nonsensical. Uh, it just models gravity with GM over R squared and a constant and a square root. So then the attention should be, okay, you know, why is that function what it is? That's a good question. Uh, and, I think I, I really appreciate the beauty of this model, which is uh, the acceleration of things going around a galaxy uh, isn't just GM over R squared. It's, a, it's approximately the square root of a constant times GM over R squared. And it fits the rotation curves really well. It fits the kinks in the rotation curves, uh, which are, you know, if there's, if, if it's, you know, if it's like the rotation curve is going like this, and then there's a bump, and then it you know, goes down. Modified gravity models that too. So that's why I think one should have a lot of confidence in the model. The other very interesting thing is that that constant, which I mentioned, you know, if you take the square root of the constant times gm over r squared, that constant approximately equals the speed of light times Hubble's constant over 2 pi. Now, how cool is that? You know, big H, Hubble's constant, shows up yet again in another cosmic phenomenon. Um, so to answer your question as to, you know, what else should we see? I think we can, um, we can see um, uh, Hubble's constant will show up in a lot more cosmic phenomena. phenomena. That's super interesting.
Yeah. Um, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it makes more sense than, you know, the models that we have today, at least for me. <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but yeah, the, yeah. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's it. Um, I, I don't have any other, uh, subjects to talk about. I don't know if you want to cover anything else. Um, um, oh, I, maybe we talk about some of the, like the real world things that are happening. So in addition to the model, um, which is that it's it's now very clear that the Big Bang LCDM model is completely false and dark matter is not a real thing and dark energy is not a real thing and that people who are extremely intelligent who've been saying what I'm saying who are in academia have not been able to make much progress um, so now the question is you know what is stopping this and I think the answers are um, that it's difficult for people within academia to speak up because to do so would risk their career and funding. Uh, I think another problem is that uh, it's very difficult to even talk about these things on the internet. It's like, I you can't even talk about this on Reddit or Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow because the moderators are unable to distinguish a sincere question from a troll. And I understand that's a hard job, but this is a problem. Moderators are not able to distinguish sincere questions challenging the status quo from trolls. Uh, and maybe the solution is, um, is that moderators should think more. <laughs> I, you know, I try to think of a solution, you know, instead of imposing new rules, but that's all I can come up with. You know, moderators really need to think more and look at the background of the people who are make who are proposing things that they might hastily claim as uh as somebody trying to uh uh troll the conversation which is not happening um, so that's another structural sociological problem um, another problem is that uh, the researchers don't see a path to doing their work more freely because even if they do somehow start some conversation that oh the big bang model is completely false you know how are they going to get funding because the grant process is uh Applying for grants is uh, uh, those grants are approved by people who this information wouldn't register with. So that's a problem. So what I'm doing is I am reaching out to uh, I've had conversations actually so far with a couple of Silicon Valley investors, uh, people who both appreciate technology growth, uh, positive disruptive change uh, and uh, and are intrinsically passionate about space. So, uh, fundraising is in the works, uh, and what we're going to do with that, those funds are massive media outreach, uh, also making grants, uh, and I hope the construction of new planetariums and observatories as a cultural, cult culturally important thing. Uh, so the funding question is being addressed. Uh, that's a really big thing. Um, and uh, um, what else is what else is happening? The um, and, and I think that I mean, this is this is going to be a pretty big, you know, this is going to be a pretty big scientific revolution. So it's now about asking questions, you know, how do we want to do science? Uh, you know, how do we want to make grants? How do we want to you know, write the future. Uh, and so I'll probably mention this, that uh, I think a lot of um, a lot of great stuff has been demonstrated by the Fast Grants program uh, run by Patrick Collison. And uh, I think that's maybe the best way to do this, even for astrophysics and cosmology. Interesting. Um, so one thing that you mentioned, uh, is that basically experiments and data uh, 
they are not matching the models that we have right now and 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 the model that you're proposing and the model that a few others have proposed uh matches a lot more the data that we we see out there in the universe and there's not too much questioning in physics which is a science which by definition is all about questioning um so you're basically proposing a new way of 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 going about science because the way we're doing right now is is really really hard to ask questions about these standard models that have been basically you know uh, they're basically dogma uh, uh, by this point right cool yeah i I have no other questions. Uh, if you want to say anything else uh, to the viewers, uh, you're free to speak. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah uh, I, I'll say a connection that I found that was quite quite amusing, uh, which is that uh, uh, the um, the uh, you know how funny is it is that is that the uh, well maybe I, it's, maybe I should I'll, people will figure that out. Uh, the I think the important thing is the. The name also matters. Uh, so the reason that I named this the big circus model is the word circus uh, comes from the word circle, which is this, essentially the same etymological roots as the word universe. And the circus itself, I think, is the peak example of human artistry and physicality. You know, the circus is a physics reality show. Uh, people are performing incredible aerial stunts, uh, incredible balancing stunts, um, and bringing in storytelling and artistry and acrobatics and uh, gymnastics at the highest level, which is something to be admired. Um, and I feel that the circus is the best word to describe uh, a model of the universe. Cool. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Sahil, for taking the time. Uh, and I, uh, I hope you have a great end of the day and weekend. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, man. Thanks, Juliana. All right.